Hello again, Physics 20s. In today's lesson, we are going to begin a new unit of study on work energy in simple harmonic motion. And in today's lesson, we are going to define simple harmonic motion and then look at a pendulum earth system, which is an example of a system that does undergo simple harmonic motion. Learning outcomes are to one, describe oscillatory motion in terms of period and frequency. Two, define simple harmonic motion as motion due to a restoring force that is directly proportional and opposite to the displacement from an equilibrium position. And then three, explain quantitatively the relationships among displacement, acceleration, velocity, and time for simple harmonic motion as illustrated by a pendulum using the small angle approximation. So let's start off with simple harmonic motion and we'll use the acronym SHM to abbreviate that. In order for an object to undergo simple harmonic motion, it needs to meet the following two criteria. One, it must swing, oscillate, vibrate, or cycle with a constant frequency or period of motion. It might seem at first glance that objects undergoing uniform circular motion would fit this criteria because objects that undergo uniform circular motion do so with a constant frequency or a constant period. However, they're not going to meet the second criteria. The second criteria is for an object to undergo simple harmonic motion, there needs to be a restoring force that is always causing the object to accelerate towards an equilibrium position. And this is something that does not happen for objects in uniform circular motion. So they're going to be out of the picture in terms of different examples we look at. The two most common examples that we're going to look at are going to be a pendulum earth system and a mass spring system. Both of these systems undergo simple harmonic motions. So let's start off with the pendulum system. So we have this fulcrum point and we have the pendulum bob down here. If I release that, this at some angle theta to the vertical, it would swing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I realize over time that this thing is eventually going to come to rest due to some friction between this length of the pendulum here and the pivot point, and also air resistance is going to slow it down. Although I believe if you release it at like a small angle and just, just let go, it, it, it does continue to go back and forth, back and forth for quite a while before it eventually does stop. We also have a mass spring system. So for this one, we have like a little tiny object, a mass attached to the end of a spring. And in the state shown, we have the spring and it's not stretched position, unstretched position. If we pull it a little bit over to the side and let go, the, the spring, the mass of the spring oscillates back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And as long as there's not any friction between the surface and this object attached to the mass, then for the most part, the frequency and the period would be constant. One other thing I want to point out before I go on to the, the next slide is the type of shape of a graph you can form from an object that undergoes simple harmonic motion. In the case of the pendulum, there's a little tiny pen that's attached to the end of the pendulum bob. And what it's doing is as it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, it's making contact with a roll of paper. If this piece of paper, this roll of paper was stationary, all I would see is the pen making a mark that goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It would just, it'd just be a single line that just look like this. However, if you start to pull the piece of paper at a constant velocity, you start to get this wave type shape. Where you have like a dip in the wave, which would be the pendulum on the right hand side, and you have this uh, top part of the wave, which would be in the pendulum is on the left hand side. 
Similar thing can be observed for the spring system. So in this case, I have a pen attached to this mass. And if this roll of paper was not moving and I release this uh, mass from rest, it would just go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, make a line like that. However, if you do start to roll the paper at a constant speed as the mass is oscillating back and forth, you'd again get this wave shape where the bottom of the wave would be when the mass is on the right hand side and the top of the wave here would be when the pendulum is on the left hand side. So that's going to be important in terms of how we define things in just a moment. Terminology. So I've taken a graph of this wave shape and what the graph is illustrating is the position of the object, either the pendulum bob or the mass attached to the spring as a function of time. The equilibrium position is the position is kind of like our reference position. That's the position where the object will eventually come to rest. Now, it should be noted, though, that before it comes to rest, the, the, the system can still pass through the equilibrium position. So, in fact, if we go back here and we look at this, so the equilibrium position would be, it'd be the line that kind of cuts the graph directly in half. So as this thing swings back and forth, back and forth, the equilibrium position for the pendulum would just be when this pendulum is oriented vertically. Over time, eventually it'll come to rest. And then yes, the pendulum will be aligned vertically, but as it's going back and forth, back and forth, it can pass through or it will pass through that equilibrium position multiple times. Same with the spring system. So in the spring system, again, to, the equilibrium position would just be a line that just cuts this wave directly in half. And as this spring oscillates back and forth, back and forth, it is passing through the equilibrium position quite a bit. We also have the amplitude. The amplitude, which you can represent by this vertical height here on the graph. That is the maximum distance of the object from the equilibrium position. So going back to the illustrations of the Earth pendulum and, and uh, the mass spring system, your amplitudes would just be the locations where either the spring is at the far right, which would be like right here, or at the far left, which would be there. And we measure the amplitude from the equilibrium position, which could be like at this location, to one of these extremes. That's my amplitude. Three, our period is the time to complete one cycle. Now, remember off the graph on the previous page, like the very top por portion of the of the wave, this would be like when the the pendulum bob or the mass in the spring is the furthest over to the left, and then the period would just represent the time it takes. If, for example, if like the pendulum started at the furthest left position, and then it went through a complete cycle where it goes to the far right position and then comes all the way back. That would be one complete cycle. So you basically need to come back to where you started. All right, so in this lesson, we're gonna focus on the simple pendulum. In the next one, we'll talk more about the mass spring system. So what I have is I have a pendulum and this is the variable L that represents the length of the pendulum. And this angle theta is the release angle relative to the vertical, relative to this vertical line. The period, as already mentioned, is the time it takes for this thing to swing forward and back one time. 
So in this illustration, the period would be the time it takes for this pendulum to swing all the way to this side and then come all the way back to that side. So it has to come back to where it started. And that would represent my period. This period can be calculated by the equation t is equal to 2 pi times the square root of L divided by G. And that is an equation that you can find on the formula sheet, I believe is in the section called waves. Not going to derive the equation because it's actually a really, really complicated derivation. It is worth noting though that for the derivation, I believe this equation only works for very small angles. Although, even though technically the equation is like most valid when we're dealing with small angles, we're still going to look at problems where we deal with large release angles relative to the vertical. In this equation, L is the length of the pendulum. G is your gravitational field strength or the magnitude of the acceleration due to gravity at the location of the pendulum and that can be expressed in units of newtons per kilogram which is typically what we use for gravitational field strength or meters per second squared if we choose to write it in terms of the magnitude of the acceleration due to gravity i do want to note though what the period does not depend on so there are two things that the period of this pendulum is not dependent on one is it doesn't matter what the mass of the pendulum bob is. And two, the amplitude of the swing also does not matter. The, math, uh, the mass, I can actually prove mathematically in a moment when we talk about the restoring force that acts on this. The amplitude doesn't make a difference. So for example, if you released the pendulum from this angle and it swung all the way over here, and then came back and let's say that took maybe like two seconds and then you release this pendulum from a different release angle different release angle would be a different amplitude so in this case this one would, would go through a smaller arc and then come back this would also be a period that is equal to two seconds. So the release height, the amplitude, or the angle relative to the vertical does not matter along with the mass of the pendulum bob. And I'll come back to that point in a moment after we look at some of the mathematical equations behind this. Now what we need to do is we need to talk about the restoring force. Because again, there, your two criteria for simple harmonic motion is your object has to have a constant period or frequency. We've already talked about that. And there also needs to be a restoring force that is always trying to get your object to go towards this equilibrium position. So the question is, in the terms of the pendulum bob, what force, if you were to draw a free body diagram of the pendulum bob, what force, so let's focus on the pendulum bob right here, what force would be responsible for getting the pendulum bob to this location? This is the equilibrium position. If you answered the pendulum bob's weight, you are correct. Although there's a specific component of the weight of the pendulum that we want to look at. So what's the restoring force acting on the pendulum bob? Well, it's a component of the force of gravity that is specifically parallel to the direction of motion that causes the pendulum to accelerate towards the equilibrium. That's my restoring force. Let's look at this by drawing a free body diagram of the pendulum bob. And let's say that we're releasing it to the right of the equilibrium position as was shown on the diagram on the previous page. If I draw a free body diagram at this position and I was the pendulum bob, I would feel the tension from the string pointing up and towards the left. And there would also be the force of gravity that is pointing straight down. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break the force of gravity into two components. 
at this point, the direction of motion, if you let go, is going to be kind of like tangent to the arc. So if we go, let's go back here for a moment. So I can see this like dashed line representing the arc. So the direction of motion at this instant would just be tangent to this arc. So it'd be pointing in a direction somewhat like this. That's what I would call the parallel direction. So FG parallel would be the component of the force of gravity that is parallel to the direction of motion. And FG perpendicular would be the component of the force of gravity that is perpendicular to the direction of motion. It is this force, the parallel component of the force of gravity that makes it go towards the equilibrium. That's because this parallel component pretty much points towards the equilibrium position. The perpendicular component of this force is not pointing anywhere near the correct direction of the equilibrium position. So specifically FG parallel is going to be the restoring force that's trying to get me to go back towards the equilibrium. Therefore, we have the restoring force is equal to FG parallel. And if we calculate this in terms of the angle theta and the force of gravity acting on the pendulum bob, this would be your restoring force is equal to FG times sine theta. I suppose the important thing to note about this equation is theta. because This is going to tell me where my restoring force is a maximum and a minimum. If you make theta bigger, so if we increase the release height, so let's say we went from like, a, I don't know, like a 30 degree angle to a 40 degree angle. So we went from sine of 30 to sine of 40. That's going to make the value of sine of theta bigger. Therefore, you're going to have a bigger restoring force if your angle is a lot bigger. Your minimum restoring force would be when theta is zero degrees. Sine of, sine of zero is zero. And where would you have theta equal to zero degrees? Well, that would be when there's a zero degree angle relative to the vertical. That would be the equilibrium position. Therefore, your restoring force is going to be the biggest, the furthest you are away from equilibrium. That's at the amplitude. And it's going to be the smallest when you pass through the equilibrium position because that angle is zero degrees. Let's relate this now to acceleration by applying Newton's second law of motion. So we have the sum of the forces in the parallel direction is equal to mass times my parallel acceleration. The net force in the parallel direction is just the parallel component of the object's weight, and that is equal to m times a. Fg parallel is Fg sine theta, and that's equal to mass times acceleration. Fg expands to m times g, so we'd have mg sine theta equals m times a. And now look what cancels off, the m's, which tells me my acceleration is equal to the gravitational field strength times sine of theta. So it's interesting to note here what the acceleration also depends on. So just like the restoring force, the acceleration of your pendulum bob is going to be bigger if the angle's bigger. The angle is bigger and is biggest when you're at your amplitude. Your acceleration is actually nothing as you pass through the equilibrium position. Now let's go back to identifying the, the factors that have no influence on the, the period of the pendulum. Okay, so the first one is we the mass of the pendulum has nothing to do with the actual period. Well, if we go back to our equation on this page here, if we look at the acceleration, the acceleration, the mass is canceled off. So we can actually prove that one mathematically. The other one though is why doesn't the amplitude matter? So here's my equation for acceleration. Acceleration is G times sine of theta. Okay, here's what we have. Let's, 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 let's compare uh, two release heights. So again, let me, I'll just write this equation again. A equals G sine theta. So let's say this is the one release height where we swing here. 
and then we come back. And then let's do a different one. I'll do it in a red where my amplitude or my release height is going to be smaller. It's going to be something like this. So it swings here and then it comes back. And then in both situations, the period is going to be the same. Well, how can we explain this? Well, first of all, let's identify which situation you have the bigger acceleration at your amplitude. Your acceleration is bigger if theta is going to be bigger. So for the purple path, this one here, your acceleration would be bigger. It's bigger because theta is bigger. Bigger sine theta, it's going to give you a bigger value for A. For this one, because my angle is smaller, your acceleration is going to be lower. We need to use this information to explain why is the period the same. Well, think of it like this. In this one, the pendulum bob has to cover a much larger distance, like much larger distance in comparison to if it was released from the height that I've drawn in, in red here. Somehow it needs to cover that extra distance in the exact same amount of time. Well, how can it do that? Well, it can do it because it has the larger acceleration. So the larger acceleration means there's a greater change in velocity. So at the end of the day, why doesn't the amplitude matter? Well, the amplitude doesn't matter because if you make the amplitude bigger, you're going to have a bigger acceleration. That bigger acceleration enables you to cover that increased distance in the exact same amount of time. So at the end of the day, the period is independent of the actual amplitude. Okay, so let's go to a couple of examples now. So I have an unknown planet, not the Earth. An astronaut found that a 20 centimeter pendulum completed 20 swings in 33.6 seconds. Calculate the gravitational field strength on the surface of this planet. Okay, so what do we know here? First of all, we know what the length is. Let's convert that immediately to meters. So 20 centimeters to meters, divide by 100. So that'd be 0 0.200 meters. The other variable I want is I want the period. What I'm told is you complete 20 swings in 33.6 seconds. Well, what exactly is the period? The period represents the number, the, the, the time required to complete a swing. So if I set up a ratio for a period, it would be time to the number of swings. Therefore, your period would be 33.6 seconds. we go through 20 swings. If we calculate this, I believe this gives us a number that would be, I'm just gonna do this quickly. So you have 33.6 divided by 20. Originally just, I'd have 1.68 seconds in one swing. Okay, so I need to be able to look at the information and interpret it in terms of how to set up a ratio to calculate the period. And I want to determine what G is. Okay, so let's go to our equation for period of a pendulum, which is T is equal to 2 pi times the square root of L divided by G. Right now, we cannot solve for G for two reasons. One, it is in the denominator of an equation, and two, it's also underneath the radical. So the first thing we should do is we need to get rid of that radical. Technically, the way that you should uh, deal with a variable underneath the radical is to isolate the radical first. So I'll do that by dividing both sides of the equation by 2 pi. So to have T over 2 pi would be equal to the square root of L divided by G. And now that we have the radical isolated, I can just take the square of both sides. So that is going to turn into 
this left hand side, you have to square every single value. So t squared, be careful, this square has to go to that two as well. So two pi all squared would be four pi squared. And that would be equal to L over G. Because you only have met one mathematical term on each side of the equation, we can use the, uh, the cross multiplication trick to isolate for G. So the way I'm going to do that, I'm going to have T squared and G flip spots. And then I'm going to bring this four pi squared up to that side to combine with the L. And then when I do this, I'm then going to get my G would be equal to four pi squared L. All divided by T squared. Let's plug the numbers in now. 4 pi squared times L, L is 0 0.200 meters. Divide this by T squared, T squared is 1.68. Seconds all squared. Then when we calculate this, we're going to go to three significant digits. You should get a number of 2.80. It does say field strength, so I'll just write it in terms of units of newtons per kilogram. And again, the way to interpret that is in terms of field strength, if you put a one kilogram mass at this location, it would experience a force of 2.80 newtons towards the center of that planet. Second example, I'm given the frequency of a period as 1.5 hertz. A, I want to calculate the period of the pendulum. Well, let's start off with that. To go between frequency and period, we have that inverse relationship, which tells me that my period is equal to one divided by the frequency. Plug the numbers in, one divided by 1.5 hertz. And that's just two thirds in terms of a fraction. So that would be equal to, and we'll do three significant digits, 0 0.667 seconds. Oh, but we're actually going to, this is this is an actual calculated answer. So let's go to two SDs. This would be 0 0.67 seconds. B. Okay, it's one of these equations where we have to deal with the variation within an uh, equation. So it says determine the new period of the pendulum if the mass is doubled, the length of the pendulum is quadrupled, and the gravitational field strength is quartered. Okay, so I have T nu would be equal to, we essentially write down the equation and just, perform, and just do a bunch of substitutions. So our original period would be 0 0.67 seconds, which is equal to 2 pi, and then the square root of L over G. The new period, we're going to sub in some different values for some of these variables. So we have 2 pi times the square root of, Okay, what are we doing to the length? We're quadrupling the length. So 4L. We're doubling the mass. Well, who cares? The period of a pendulum does not depend on the mass. I'll even write down who cares. And the gravitational field strength is quartered. So instead of writing down uh, G, we're going to write down quartering something and be going G divided by four. Okay, a little bit of an ugly fraction because we've got that double, deno uh, double fraction thing going on. So let's try to clean this up. So this would be two pi times the square root of four L. And I'm going to replace this fraction symbol with division. So we divided by G over four. This would be equal to two pi times the square root of 4L. And dividing by a fraction is the same thing as multiplying by my reciprocal. So I'll flip it around to 4 over G. And then this would be equal to 2 pi. And then I would have the square root of 16L over G. 
I'm going to separate this radical. So we have 2 pi. And I'm going to separate it into two parts. I'm going to separate it into square root 16 multiplied by square root of L over G. Mathematically, I'm allowed to do that as long as it is a product. The square root of 16 is 4. So this would be equal to, we'll take the positive square root because a negative period doesn't make any sense. So you have 2 pi and then you have 4 times the square root of L over G. I'm going to bring this 4 all the way in front. I'm not going to combine it with the 2 pi. I'll tell you why in a moment. You get 2 pi square root L over G. When you do one of these proportion, these uh, variations within an equation problems, what you try to do is you, you sub in these different changes and you want to find two things. You want to find your original equations. My original equation is 2 pi square root L over G. So that's this part here. And you want some kind of numerical coefficient in front of it. That's why I didn't combine the 4 with the 2 because it would be difficult to see what that numerical coefficient is. So what I can see here is because I have that 4 in front, that tells me the factor in which the period is going to increase by. Therefore, T nu would be equal to 4 times the old period. So it increased by a factor of 4. However, since I know what the old period is, I can calculate this. So I can go T nu would be equal to 4 times the old period, which is 0 0.67 seconds. And then I get T nu is equal to 2.7 seconds. Again, expect to see some more of these questions uh, with these variations within the equations. And one other thing to watch out for is sometimes I can just put in misleading information. Because you might be wondering, well, how, I can, how can I possibly get that mass, the doubled mass in there? Well, you don't need to because the period is actually independent of that mass. That's it for this lesson. And you can complete the assignment called Simple Harmonic Motion of Pendulums. And then in the next lesson, we'll talk about Simple Harmonic Motion of that mass spring system that I briefly talked about at the start of the lesson. And I'll talk to you then.